Well, welcome back to part two of the, this week's uh, opening set of videos as we talk about African Americans and American sports history. Uh, this is Professor Geertz again. I'm actually joined now by a special guest who's going to introduce himself. Hi, I'm Isaiah Geertz, and I'm a fourth grader at Parkview Center School. So uh, I asked Isaiah to join us because uh, the two of us, even before the quarantine season, spent a lot of time playing a, a dice and card game called Stratomatic Baseball. We simulate baseball, and we're currently simulating a season that includes a lot of Negro League All-Stars. We're going to talk about them later. So Isaiah's going to jump on once we get to the story of the Negro Leagues to talk about some of his favorite players. So, of course, in part one, we tried to set the table talking about the transition in American history from slavery to racial segregation, Jim Crow laws, and at least in sports, the color line, which affects baseball, but affects many different sports. We're going to just focus on baseball. Today, then, we want to talk about what segregation looks like in American society and in sports. So the supposed idea of segregation is separate but equal. That was what allowed the Supreme Court to rule it constitutional in 1896 in Plessy v. Ferguson. Uh, and of course, that, that keeps baseball players like Moses Fleet Walker out of the major and minor leagues. 24 years after his playing career, end, playing career ended, uh, Fleet Walker writes a book in 1908 called Our Home Colony, a treatise on the past, present, and future of the Negro race in America. And in it, he comes to the conclusion that there is no future for black people in America and that they should instead seek to colonize Africa. It's called the Back to Africa Movement. Uh, it had started even in before the Civil War. Uh, a lot of white abolitionists, including for a time Abraham Lincoln, thought that was the best solution, was essentially racial separation. Uh, its most famous advocate is a Jamaican immigrant named Marcus Garvey, who in 1914 creates the Universal Negro Improvement Association, and he tries to encourage African Americans to separate from the white race and, if necessary, to move back to places like Africa. Now, very few do. And so instead, what we're left with is in 1900, almost 9 million Americans are black, double what it had been in 1860, and most of them still live in the South under Jim Crow. And so the question for uh, African Americans, especially in the South, but really all over the United States, is what do you do about that? Do you try to change the system or do you accommodate to it? And for many years, the dominant response was one of trying to live with separate but equal. For example, in 1895, uh, one of the most famous African Americans in history gives a speech in Atlanta, Georgia, to a mostly white group of business leaders. And he takes up this question. So this is a year before Plessy v. Ferguson, but Jim Crow is in place. And he argues that uh, the whites should encourage blacks to set up their own successful institutions. Uh, for example, he says this. We shall constitute, uh, African Americans, shall constitute one third and more of the ignorance and crime of the South or one third of its intelligence and progress. We shall contribute one third to the business and industrial prosperity of the South or we shall prove a veritable body of death, stagnating, stagnating, depressing, retarding every effort to advance the body politic. Essentially encouraging whites to support the creation of successful, thriving, separate black institutions like schools and businesses. And at the end, the speaker takes up the question of whether black people should try to, to change, to bring about equality. And he says that the wisest among my race understand that the agitation of questions of social equality is the extremist folly that progress and the enjoyment of all the privileges that will come to us must be the result of severe and constant struggle rather than of artificial forcing. Uh, and there had been attempts to end this. Remember, Plessy v. Ferguson started because there are people who challenged Jim Crow in New Orleans, Louisiana. Uh, near the end of his life, Frederick Douglass is still railing against this racial hierarchy and trying to restore the promises of reconstruction, of racial equality, and full participation for African Americans. But this speaker says, no, if, if this is going to ever happen, it has to be through long, long change. And it's got to result from black setting up successful separate institutions. Of course, this is Booker T. Washington, who famously founds the Tuskegee Institute, which becomes a model of a black educational institution, which trains then black leaders at all levels of society. And he also founds a National Business League for African Americans. And in places like Atlanta, in Washington, D.C., in Baltimore, Maryland, you do get a kind of black middle class. And some of those uh, successful black businessmen will become important in the sports story as owners of teams. We'll come back to that. 
So what does that look like in sports? Well, most famously in baseball, it leads to an acceptance of the color line in the attempt of creating a separate African-American league or leagues called the Negro Leagues. So your reading for uh, Monday and Tuesday in Davies will say a lot more about the history of the Negro Leagues and about uh, its most famous figures, starting with a former pitcher named Rube Foster. So there are black teams right from the late 19th into the 20th century. Uh, Chicago is kind of a key center for this. There are a number of teams like the Leland Giants, the Union Giants, uh, and Rube Foster is a success successful pitcher. Uh, supposedly, he teaches the screwball to Christy Mathewson, the Christian gentleman who plays for the New York Giants. But Rube Foster has higher ambitions than simply to be a paid player. He becomes a manager and then the owner of his own team in 1910, the Chicago American Giants which have a kind of relationship with uh, the Chicago White Sox, the white American League team. And Foster is very successful, but he wants something more systematized, more institutionalized, to use Dr. Moore's word from February. In 1920, he and other owners come together in Kansas City, Missouri, to found the Negro National League. And then eventually you get a, a competing league, or actually multiple leagues. This is the most successful one, at least through the Roaring Twenties. And it uh, starts holding its own all-star game. This is from the mid-1920s. And there are a number of Hall of Famers, uh, kind of from left to right. You've got people like Bull Joe Rogan, an outfielder and pitcher. Cool Papa Bell, probably the fastest player in baseball history. I've got Louis Santop as a great catcher. Biz Mackey is a great catcher. Judy Johnson's a, a slick fielding infielder. And you see Rube Foster standing kind of front and center. He sees the kind of uh, very sturdy guy with the white hat on. And he's really the driving force of this. And he's a dynamic personality, an entrepreneurial businessman. And this is his solution, not to try to integrate Major League Baseball, but create a black league that can thrive on its own and maybe even become a competitor to white Major League Baseball. And in a sense, this is a working out of the Atlanta Compromise, of Booker T. Washington's ideas of racial self-sufficiency. Stay in the United States, work within the system, and try to dem demonstrate that you can succeed, that you can, um, you can thrive as much as, as white people can. Um, unfortunately, the Negro National League is not going to last for very long, uh, and it's really dealt two death blows. Uh, Rube Foster suffers a nervous breakdown and dies in 1930, and of course, the Great Depression also hits. And so by 1932, these initial leagues are gone, but they're eventually replaced by other leagues. And even in the midst of the Great Depression, Negro League baseball starts to take off and thrive. Let me show you a picture from a little bit later on. This is Chicago, Comiskey Park, the White Sox home park, which Negro League players used often. August 1936, the East-West game between uh, the two major Negro Leagues at that point. And here again, you've got many different Hall of Famers. Cool Papa Bell is still there, among others. Here I'm going to let Isaiah just tell you about three of his favorite players. Now the East wins this game 10-2 in a blowout, and their manager is this man. So Isaiah, what can you tell us about Oscar Charleston? Oscar Charleston is one of our best hitters. He's a great center fielder that doesn't make many errors and gets to a lot of balls. I think we call him almost like a five-tool player. He's often compared to Willie Mays and reckoned kind of right up there with Mays as a great all-around player. Uh, by that point, Charleston's playing career was ending. He was actually the manager of the East team at this point, and two of his best players, I think most of us recognize their names. Isaiah, what can you tell us about, uh, let's start with Satchel Page. So Satchel Paige is a great pitcher. He probably has the most complete games in our league, and he's just really good. Yeah, uh, a tremendous strikeout pitcher. Mm -hmm. You know, Even in our game, we've had this thing happen where he'll walk the bases loaded and then strike out the side. Uh, so that, that's Satchel Paige for you. And then a catcher, Josh Gibson. Josh Gibson is probably the best hitter in our league. He does make a lot of pass balls, but he's still really good. Yeah, I think right now in his league, he has an OPS of like 1,300 or so. Basically, you just want to walk Josh Gibson every single time. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't really know for sure. Records uh, are a little spotty from Negro League ball, but Josh Gibson is estimated to have hit at least 800 and possibly as many as 1,000 home runs in his career. So thanks, Isaiah. Welcome. So those are some of the stars, and eventually they get recognition. Even in their time, they're, they're fairly well known. They often play against white players in uh, exhibition games in the offseason. There's a famous series of games between Dizzy Dean, great white pitcher for the St. Louis Cardinals, and Satchel Page-led team. 
Uh, and so white players certainly are aware that black players are their equals. And yet the color line continues to be enforced through the 1930s and the Negro Leagues continue to play. Now you might notice that a lot of these players have a P on their uniform. That means they play for a team called the Pittsburgh Crawfords. So this is four years earlier where you see the Crawfords. Uh, they're owned by a Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania businessman named Gus Greenlee. You'll read more about him in Davies. He's an interesting character. Uh, he runs a kind of gambling operation called the Numbers Game, but he also is successful in legitimate businesses as well. And so he owns this team, builds it its own stadium in Pittsburgh. And it's kind of significant that Pittsburgh is such an important center because that's nowhere near the South. There are actually two great teams. I'll tell you about the Homestead Grays in a second. So here's a somewhat younger Satchel Page next to Josh Gibson. They also uh, oppose each other a number of times. They're both from the South. Let me show you a map of what I'm talking about. So Josh Gibson is from Georgia. Satchel Page is from Mobile, Alabama, the port city industrial center. And they're part of what's called the Great Migration. So this starts around 1910 to 1915, and then it really hastens with World War I, which creates a lot of war industry jobs up the Mississippi River in places like St. Louis, Memphis, but then eventually places like Chicago, Milwaukee, Minneapolis, Indianapolis, Detroit, Cleveland, and of course Pittsburgh, and then along the eastern seaboard, Philadelphia, New York, Boston. So in the initial wave of the Great Migration up until the Great Depression, uh, something like about a one to two million uh, Southern blacks leave and head for the Midwest and the North. And then this continues in the rest of the 20th century after World War II, uh, and that's when especially you get settlement of Los Angeles, San Francisco, Pacific, uh, Northwest, Denver, and the Southwest as well. And so you can see that reflected in uh, the Negro Leagues. Most of them are in northern cities uh, for audiences of often former southern blacks who've moved up to take jobs. And by the 1940s, they're often pretty good jobs because they're war industry jobs. World War II amplifies this, really starts the second wave, and it creates an audience for Negro League baseball of uh, fans who've got money to spend. And at its peak in this time period, the Negro Leagues are getting 900,000 to a million fans a year. They're really thriving as World War II continues. But World War II raises an important question. So I mentioned Pittsburgh has two great uh, Negro League teams in this time period. The second one is called the Homestead Grays. They eventually moved to Washington, D.C., but in the 30s, they're still in Pittsburgh. And their owner is a former player turned uh, businessman named Cumberland or Cum Posey. And Cum Posey, in addition to owning the Homestead Grays, owns a newspaper called the Pittsburgh Courier, which is really a vital organ of African-American life in the 1930s and 40s. I mean, it's like the New York Times of black America. And early in World War II, in January 1942, a reader of the Pittsburgh Courier from Wichita, Kansas, writes a letter to the Courier that poses a really important question. So the writer's name is James Thompson, and he, he asked this. Being an American of dark complexion, some 26 years old, these questions flash through my mind. Should I sacrifice my life to live half American? Will things be better for the next generation in the peace to follow? Would it be demanding too much to, to demand full citizenship rights in exchange for the sacrificing of my life? Is the kind of America I know worth defending? Will America be a true and pure democracy after this war? Will colored Americans suffer still the indignities that have been heaped upon them in the past? These and other questions need answering. I want to know. And I believe every colored American who is thinking wants to know. And Thompson, at the end of the letter, proposes what's called the double V. That black Americans should indeed go off and fight for victory over fascism against the Germans in Europe, but only if they get victory over racism here in America, in the South and in the North. And the Courier is, is uh, a leading advocate of this double V idea. Now, it ends up not working out immediately, but it helps energize the civil rights movement. And in the sports world, this is true as well. So uh, I started the first film in this series with Jackie Robinson as a college athlete. Let me show you what he looks like during World War II. This is second Lieutenant Jackie Robinson, who enters the military. This is actually an unfortunate picture because it cuts off someone is saluting him. As an officer, he has an important role to play, and he challenges the Jim Crow South. He refuses to sit in the black only section of a bus, he's arrested, tried in a court martial, and nine white officers unanimous, unanimously acquit him. 
He's uh, honorably discharged in 1944. And at that point, to make a living, he decides to enter Negro League Baseball. He goes to Kansas City, Missouri to play for the Monarchs alongside Satchel Paige. And we'll pick up Jackie Robinson's story in our third film, which tells the move from segregation to integration.